as I say on my other video about Europa life, I believe there may be no life because of no surface in which for the life to compute if it's all under the water. And above where the water meets the ice, it may be too cold for life to get much process to start. It's now believed that life on Earth started not in the ocean, but rather in sulfur pools. And there are people who say, well, inside of Europa, in the rocky core, through the tidal flexing, we'll find these geologically active pools where life is abundant in the ocean. My belief is it may have started on land because in the ocean each day, it's going to carry away the results of the computation each time it starts. But when you have sulfur pools, it's more self-contained. And so you have a higher speed of the computation also because of the higher temperatures and all the results will be maintained. And they're finding the basic stuff by which life may have evolved from these sulfur pools into the ocean. So a land-based sulfur pool, as they say, life needs a surface on which computers are finding with like sugars on distant surfaces. Without those surfaces, it won't compute. So land is a better interface, and most of the fish live within five miles of the shore. So I think of these sulfur ponds as the spark of life, and only later did it evolve into the ocean, which is not as easy to compute, and so life was only later water-based. And the ice does seem a problem for life in Europe, but it's so cold. And Carl Sagan in the 60s, he was so interested in life on Mars, he wasn't going to give up when he found that it was a stone with frigid sands. He decided to ask someone to paint him a picture without the fiber dots <laughs> of what life might be on Mars. So he painted this jellyfish-type creature with shields above the shield from the UV rays of the sun and like small legs that are spindly, which don't need much to lift against the gravity that's lower in Mars. They say in the evolution of the life on the Earth that the moon may have been quite important to our geohistory because as old as I am, you would say the moon creates tides and those tides not only keep the ocean circulating, but they also generate those tidal pools because each month there's like the first of the month, two thirds of the volcanoes and earthquakes. And a volcano is both steam, which is three fourths steam, and that would be the source of the oceans. And also, it would stir up the magma process, so it stirs up all the nutrients from underneath called lava. But if we have this sloshing around, and this allowed the computation both of the sulfur pools and the boiling up of nutrients, they asked why Ice Age megafauna were just that, and they say they didn't know why. I think it's because the glaciers would flow in and out each year. They scrape up huge amounts of minerals, and they have these glacial lakes that all the life is just totally thriving get larger and larger in size because it's also cool, so they don't have to worry about overheating like a lot of the larger animals would. I'm not worried about overheating now, that thanks to global warming, October starts in August. But I believe that this isn't true because one problem is, as the asteroid would smack into the Earth, it's going to melt all the ocean that's there, and it's also going to, its own water is just going to go back outward to steam and not be captured by the Earth, it's moving at such high speed. And volcanoes really do exude a lot of steam, this would be a stable method for the Earth to get its water. One problem with the Earth and Moon is that the Moon is larger relative to the Earth than all the other planets in the solar system by far. So the Moon couldn't keep the Earth or other Earth-like worlds from simply tilting over and becoming tidally locked sooner or later, like by glaciation. The idea that the snowball Earth in the Archeozoic or way back when was the cause of them not being able to find any direction in which the land is, there's no land, it's all ice. I think this may not be true because one side of it might have become totally locked and they only find the land where the ice was, where there was land on the other side, just a desert with lower elevation. We're assuming it filled up with water or covered over by like the subduction because a lot of the crust has been submerged by the bulldozer of the change of the shift of the plates. So a large moon would stir up the life by tides and sulfur pools and it would also have gotten the Earth out of ice ages several times. There's been two great ice ages in the Archeozoic. They're a million years each. They say that we haven't found any advanced life on other worlds. Look up why are all the galaxies lit up by them? Perhaps the real reason is that the moon was a captured moon of ours, and it's so rare for Earth-like worlds to have a moon that's large enough to have all these cool events that cause their life. The moon is indeed believed by most scientists who are involved with this research to have been captured. And I think of that picture that Carl Sagan had painted and I look at it, and there's one thing that really struck me. And he's drawn this sort of jelly-like creature on Mars. And 
those shields from ultraviolet light. What's the problem with shields of ultraviolet light? And the answer would be that all the rocks on Mars are radioactive. And what could have caused this radioactivity? I think it's the moon on the Earth that's shielding us from it, that's shielding us. So instead of having the radiation coming in and changing the early life, we're going to start. So we have the shield caused by the moon going around the Earth. And at a thousand miles below the center of the Earth is the Earth moon system center of gravity. But the liquid core is deeper down. And you may say, well, why isn't the liquid core where the moon and Earth meet? Is the pressure is greatest and all that. And I think it's because the pressure is greater deeper down. But the core would maintain the magnetic field which would shield us from those harmful uh, cosmic rays that create radioactivity. And so as it would slosh around with the tides of the moon, this would be really the source of the geomagnetism. So geomagnetism, as you would say, may be less common, much less common on distant worlds that would be like Earth. I would think that radioactivity may make life much more tough than just a simple source of light like we have. The reason being that radioactivity disrupts all the chemical processes of life, but light merely enhances them. If you have the source of your radioactivity being complex, then life is both damaged by it. It might have a power source, it's true, but that life is also irreparably damaged in its chemical structure by the changes of the radioactivity. It's believed that the finding that there's no advanced life makes us look really bad. We may not have much of a chance because there may be so many of these Earth-like civilizations that something happened to them. But I think it may be much less probable that life can exist on Earth-like worlds because of this radioactivity problem. And in the history of the solar system, the moon is believed to be captured. And so it's not that improbable that the moon is really from somewhere else. And I think it may have come from the asteroid planet before it blew up. And an impact at high speed, which is not improbable due to the high speed relative to which the solar system will be moving relative to an outside impactor coming in and hitting the asteroid planet. So the moon is going at the right speed to move and be captured by the Earth. As I say elsewhere, if the moon came from outside the solar system, its speed relative to the solar system would be too fast and it would blow up the Earth, it almost did anyhow. And if its origin was in the solar system, as so much of life is, it would have to have been blown to bits to escape Jupiter's gravity or a large planet's gravity. And I believe that large moons relative to the size of the planet are rare. Maybe really rare because the planet sweeps up all the debris and stuff that would make that moon, all the asteroids. And Jupiter is basically a sort of giant shield from the Earth. We don't get hit by giant asteroids that often because the shield from Jupiter is making it so we're safe. And the same would hold for the formation of Earth-like planets. The satellites around them, all the matter falls into the planet, and only some of it like impacts into the moon as it's going around. So the moon is sort of plowing through the debris, plowing through the field to form its formation. And here's what's interesting about finding if there's life on Europa. It's believed that most life in the cosmos would be inside of moons like Europa, inside their oceans, which is like three times as much as the Earth's oceans. Like a sleepy blue ocean, the oceans are so old-fashioned. I mean, why can't you buy a luxury liner for just a thousand? Way back when, I had wondered why. Well, I knew why I was so wise, but I wondered if radioactivity could power the life inside of Europa from Jupiter. And I think it may be involved with the hydrological cycle of Europa. They say the tectonics are like ice tectonics that flows in and out. And this may be help us to find out there's life deeper down. And because it's radioactive, I think this may totally taint all the water eventually of Europa, making life impossible. Another question I've asked is whether life might be possible underneath the surface of Mars. There's lava tubes there we could actually go down under, and there's a large area we could just cover up with holes, which would be small, and fill it full of air. We've got a place to live. It's cheap and easy. Areology doesn't cost so much. You may not know, but areology was the study of Mars, and selenology is the research about the moon, because Selena was the moon goddess. Like the Japanese moon goddess is called Titan, and this is the name of the Japanese moon program. They used to spear the moon with a probe without having to worry about landing. Titan means music in heaven in Japanese. My question about Mars was, each day on Mars, as the day goes on, the air pressure rises and falls. So I thought if this connects down to the caverns deeper down that would be eroded by the water caused by this change because it would change the humidity each day deeper down where it's warm under Mars. 
unlike on Earth, when you go down 10,000 feet, it's 100 degrees temperature increase because the temperature changes one degree per 100 feet as you go down inside the Earth. So the area where life exists inside this zone is much broader. And so I thought with this dripping and dripping of the water in the subterranean areas, large caverns could be carved out inside of Mars. And so this flow of water might also be enough to create life like bacteria, which would use the heat for its life source. I think the best idea here will be to check for vents where there might be life breathing out the steam on Mars. They haven't found any yet. And while I think it's possible, I think it's also possible that the radioactivity on the surface rocks may taint the water supply so much that life may never have evolved on Mars, both because of the super slow temperatures on the surface, but also because of the radioactivity, the lack of stirring by the large moon that Mars lacks, and also because of other causes like the lack of an ocean that a large moon would also cause. So I might say good luck, unlike Carl Sagan, to those future travelers to distant Earth-like worlds, because all you may be visiting is a radioactive wasteland. And Carl Sagan being as cool as he was, he wasn't maybe as much a realist as I am, although I've had the luck of more information. <laughs> and he was saying, good luck to your future travelers on Mars. I don't know what your motivation was to go, but I wish you well. Finally, I want to say that I think that it's not all doom and gloom about Mars, although most Earth-like worlds may not have life on them because of this, even if they have liquid water even. I think that Mars may turn to be cheap to terraform and relatively easy because NASA is proposing that we use a magnetic bubble in the Mars L5 where the orbit is stable, and there they would form a sort of tube that shields from the sun's cosmic rays. And the problem with this would be the soil is still radioactive and not show from the cosmic rays themselves, which come from all directions. So I think the most cheaper method might be to put a magnetic bubble itself on one of the moons like of Jupiter or other moon that we want to use. And it simply uses the strong magnetic field of Jupiter to exit from Jupiter travel in a straight line at high enough speed to Mars that it reaches it relatively soon. Then we just put an orbit around Mars. We let it go into orbit on Mars. And then we crash asteroids into the side of Mars. We do this by using a laser maser to simply move a small asteroid, and then using its gravity that whizzes past a larger, and then that past perhaps a larger one yet, to then hope to move it to crash into the side of Mars, to give us like water, land, and air that isn't radioactive by the source. These methods will be a hugely cheaper way to terraform Mars. You can see more about some of my other videos, cheap ways of making Mars habitable.